Hey guys, Matt. Uh, chapter 28 is a transition chapter into what I consider to be one of the hearts of the book. The next chapter should be the big what are the chances section or how is this possible section where every single reality anomaly I've listed out over the years or wrote in the scrapbook is all put together. I think I'm going to try to do it all at once. It'll probably be a two hour video of me talking into the camera. I'm not going to read most of it. I'm going to talk through most of it for a variety of different reasons. And I'll also structure it so it's not ridiculously conspiratorial just for people at our quote level. If you want to bring a friend, for example, or somebody in the household to the next video, I'm going to try to do it in that manner. Just, hey, listen to this guy present <laughs> the list of reality anomalies. How is this possible? How is that possible? It just goes on and on and on. And um, it probably will be close to two hours. But I'm not going to get into hardcore conspiracy. It's just going to be each fact or, or reality glitch is going to stand on its own. And once you get, you know, into past the tenth one, and you do your what are your chances probability threshold something I'll address here in this chapter you, you get into one in billions very quickly and then you get into the chances of all of this being natural one in trillions and then that should break most people's uh, coincidence threshold so um, yeah I'm gonna do it that way and if there's anybody that um, you know you might want to sit down and watch it with I will make sure I keep certain things to ourselves, if you know what I mean, so they're not completely creeped out and triggered and storm off saying, I can't believe you asked me to watch another conspiracy theory video. Anyway, guys, uh, here's chapter 28. The biggest objection now needs to be addressed. Why would they lie to us? This is the big question the newbies will press upon the conspiracy theorist veterans. The why question is every other sentence out of their mouth like a five-year-old child why this why would they do that why 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 if we can't answer the why the people around us they will run back to Don Lemon to eat the reality muffins that he just baked It's questions like these if you say the Statue of Liberty is something else why would they lie about it what do they get out of that if you propose that the moon is not what they say it is why the hell would they lie about that you're basically saying like almost everything is counterfeit. That's what this whole book has been about so far. What do they get out of that? Why present a constant ending of lie? I mean, a constant stream of lies. I mean, why not just tell us the truth? They'd still be billionaires either way. I can't see why they would go through all the trouble to lay down a massive deception. It seems also impossible to pull off. Because it makes no logical sense, they would lie all the time about all of this then um, you have to be wrong. There's no way you can be right, Mr. Author. Unless you are neck deep in this stuff, these questions uh, are very powerful when passed from one, quote, regular person to the next on the street. The lie, uh, the way we present it, we, it becomes so massive that it couldn't possibly be true uh, to the person on the street. But, I mean, the reason the lie is so massive is simply for that reason. The massive lie is never considered. Um, again, one of the examples I've used, and this certainly doesn't apply to the massive lie being delivered by this reality script, but when the mayor simply walks out of the bank holding two bags of silver, everybody thinks it's, it's in broad daylight. It's, well, he's just doing his job. He's stealing, he's stealing two bags of silver. If he runs out in the middle of the night and tries to hide it, then it looks suspicious. It all looks normal. Uh, the reality that's presented through the news is presented to be just absolutely normal. And that's one of the ways the, hot, the lie is hidden. It's like pick a topic. U.S. involvement in Afghanistan pushing a quarter century. If you go back and include all the time Zygmunt Brzezinski was in there uh, recruiting his OBLs for the current and future part, it's pushing a quarter century. But the news comes on and says, Today in Afghanistan, the transitional government did this, and the U.S. Embassy got involved and did this, and people watch and go, oh, well, yeah, that's normal. Yeah, that's, that's, I guess that's just the best we can do. They don't step back and go, pushing a quarter century involvement in Afghanistan? For what? Uh, 
I was told in like fifth grade direct fighting in Europe, World War II was, I don't know, like 20 months. But quarter century in Afghanistan. It's just presented. They've learned that they can present any bit of nonsense, anything that doesn't add up, that, that violates every single element of reason and common sense. As long as it's presented professionally on the news, they get away with it somehow. So back to why would they lie to us? They don't lie for no reason. You won't like the beginning of my answer, and it'll seem like a cop-out, but please give me a chance. I promised in this section to address this, but not really answer it. Plus, believe it or not, we're actually early on in the book. Believe it or not. This book is about getting people to see their entire reality, and as it's presented to them, is a lie. Which means a gigantic trick is being played. This book is not about the motivations of those who present the lie, although I do discuss that later, towards the end of the book. But as we've talked about, the exact motivations of somebody sticking a knife in your back is not pertinent to change your own self and your own behavior. It's also, that's a chase they want us engaged in forever. Um, it's, a, it's a whole separate issue. I will address it from time to time. I will talk about the motivations of whatever creatures are behind the scenes. But honestly, it can't be done right now. I haven't even presented the unabridged unabridged list of lies yet. It's like a, as long as an unabridged dictionary. You don't even know the full nature of the lie. Well, people listening to this do, but you know, I'm, I'm, who am I writing this for? But it's, it's natural to apply, take me to the last page of the book syndrome, when presented with such unbelievable conspiracy. As we've talked about, people's normal reaction is to immediately demand to know all the elements, who, what, where, when, and why, and to be shown the story's end, without paying attention to anything in the middle. I don't know if that's how they've been programmed, or they use that as a mental defense mechanism, uh, because when, obviously, the last page of the story can't always be delivered immediately, they'll use that as a way to walk away from the entire argument. Look, for anybody new to this sort of stuff, just consider me to be your private investigator. Here's an example. I haven't yet proved your husband is cheating on you, and you're asking me to explain why he would do it. Why he would throw away your whole family life. I, I, haven't, I, haven't even, I haven't even trailed him yet. I haven't followed him around town yet. We, we were not, I'm not ready to analyze why your husband would do it. Even if I was a psychologist... I haven't even taken a picture of him yet in the act. We're only in the second inning here. Nevertheless, this pressing question must be addressed a bit. Why would they lie about all these things when they could just tell the truth? First, never assume you can apply your own motivations and what you generally know about the motivations of, quote, mankind to the small group that runs things from behind the dark curtain. You and they are not the same. We may be very, very different. Now, I'm not saying that they are not human or alien, but they could be. Now, alien does not mean little green men running around with ray guns. If they have just one chromosome, that's different. It's not the same as you and I. What's all this junk DNA they talk about in us all the time? If we just have one slight little DNA difference, then that, by definition, is alien. They would be alien. Actually, in understanding the controlling element that pulls its levers here from behind the curtain, it's best to think of them as alien and not like you at all, no matter how true that is or not. It's best to think of them like that if there's any chance of understanding them. Again, the things George Bush reported to may not be, quote, aliens, but they certainly are alien, if you see what I mean. For example, the psyche of Jeffrey Dahmer or Hannibal Lecter or Adolf Hitler is, quote, alien, per the definition of alien. There are two parts to the puppet master control structure. We have the George Bush creatures, the Obama sock puppets, and then all the other people that see on TV. That's part one. The people in the spotlight, like we've talked about many times, people that put their big fat faces on the screen, run and control next to nothing. Then we have something that we've talked about being behind the curtain. That 
really pulls the levers. They'll show it to you in media. They'll show you the Wizard of Oz and what the control structure is in a rudimentary way. It's the difference between the Mayor of London and the Lord Mayor of the City of London. Don't know what the second one is? Well, that's the point. It's these creeps who runs things and not the regular mayor of London who's on TV. Of course, the first Muslim mayor, and that follows the script, and this follows the script, and then the media presents the script. The public figures are not who run anything. Okay, that guy's the clown, the actor, the puppet, the stand-in for the real authority. The Lord, per the title, the Lord Mayor of the City of London, who you think has more power. What's that guy's name, that clown, Sadiq Khan? We don't know exactly who or what they are, but we just should realize that those who pull strings have motivations that are not yours. They have motivations that, that can never be seen as normal by you and I. Stop thinking that they are like you. They are not like you. In some cases, their motivations are not recognizable as even being human. It's more complicated than this, but everybody knows the primary motivations of those who rise to the apex of politics is not money, but power. Did anyone actually just say people rise up in politics because they want to help people? Well, if anybody just thought that, you got a long way to go. For those who lurk behind the final curtain, it doesn't stop at money. When the power comes, there is no amount of it then that satiates them. They just want more and more and more. From Emperor Kublai Khan of the Mongol Horde, or Tartaria, whichever you prefer, to Napoleon, not Napoleon Dynamite, but Napoleon of France, people like Joseph Stalin to Donald Trump, and the list goes on and on and on. All these types are gigantic egomaniacs who just want to dominate others. Of course, Money comes along for the ride, and it's a nice side effect for them. But trust me, there's no argument about the money versus power motivation. Even Yale history teachers and Harvard sociologists would agree with me and say their motivations are first and foremost about power and not money. Most, like Scarface said in the movie, will seek money first, but only to get the power. Hitler and types like Idi Amin didn't have to do that. Dictators with guns at their disposal can follow the direct route to power, and that comes through spilling of blood. They didn't need the money first. Scarface, after, remember that scene in Scarface when uh, he's sitting with his friend, and he stuck his friend stuck his tongue out at that girl, and then the girl slapped him in the face. They're sitting at that outdoor bar in Miami. Scarface, you think you could do it with her? I think I could do it with her. You gonna do it with her? Well, watch this. That, that guy over there is gonna go with that girl. He's gonna stick his tongue out at her. That scene. Okay, in that scene, you don't have to know the scene, but Scarface told us the pecking order. He says, first you get the money. I can't do it. I'm going to try. You cockroach. First you get the money. Then you get power. Then you get the woman. The money, the power, then the woman. I know that's horrible. But he was just, that's just lip service from Scarface. He didn't mean that. He wasn't seriously placing the woman as the ultimate and final goal. No, no, no. The power-hungry never do it for the women, as a rock and roll singer may. Forget Scarface's words. What were his actions? He got the money first from his drug empire. Then he sought out Michelle Pfeiffer to help him get the power. Because I quote Tony Montana one more time very poorly. Baby, with the right woman, I could go straight to the top, baby. Now, he was using... Michelle Pfeiffer to get the power. The woman was a stepping stone to the power hungry, not not what Scarface actually said. All he cared about was obtaining the highest rung of power, like all of these criminal psychopaths do. Even knowing Michelle Pfeiffer's character to be an absolute bitch, oh, she was, in that movie, he still needed her to complete his quest for power. He was perfectly content to put up with that bitchy attitude of hers because it got him higher up the power ladder. Now, was the dumb but pretty druggy Michelle Pfeiffer in the movie instrumental in helping Tony climb to the top of the drug empire? No, but all that matters is Tony believes she was. 
Her real value was only in Tony's mind, and that's all that's important. Maybe he felt he couldn't be a convincing drug lord without a trophy wife on his arms. Who knows what his motivations were? Just like Jack on the Titanic, an immigrant like Tony Montagna will never be allowed into the top floor of the pyramid on the back of the dollar bill. That's reserved for families and bloodlines. Even people like Bill Clinton are low on that particular totem pole. The first great answer as to why would they lie to us all the time is oversimplified here but accurate. The truth, the real truth of this world, would take away a great deal of power from the controllers or utterly ruin them in a lot of areas if the real truth was known and revealed or taught in school. I don't have 50 pages here to explain it. We touch on it on and off as we move forward. But take banking, for example. Remember the Henry Ford quote that was discussed in a previous section? He said the people would revolt with torches and pitchforks, basically, if they understood the banking and money system. Would 300 million pissed off people looking for their lighters be good for you as the CEO of J.P. Morgan? You'll see there are a thousand reasons to lie. If your address is the penthouse floor in that pyramid on the back of the dollar bill. Also, there are cult, esoteric, and hard to explain reasons why they must put forth this never ending lie, this grand trick. I can't say more than that now. It's too early on, and you aren't ready for it yet anyway. Now, the old guard listening is, of course, but remember who I wrote this book for. I know I've not explained why they lie about these things. Where it appears to the neophyte, they have no reason to deceive at all. Ah, but they do, Captain Ogren. They do. Okay, going away from the book for a second, uh, the old guard knows all of this already, but people here are at different levels. So let me just say one thing that's very important to a lot of people that may be listening. Uh, to amass the power for themselves that they want to amass, they have to do it in a certain way. Now, we, we know this by now. We don't know all the details, but it's just been demonstrated over and over and over again. If they want to take a big bite, a big bite out of humanity, for example, it has to present it, be presented as a trick. They have to get away with it. And if they can get away with it over here, then they're allowed, per this cosmic law of karma or universal law, we don't know exactly what that is, but we know it exists. If they screw us over here with a certain trick, then they're allowed to take a equal size big bite over here. And over here, if they actually show us what they're going to do and give hints and drop truth in media and movies and all over the place, then per this cosmic law, however it works, then they almost could say, well, we showed them what we were going to do. And of course, they didn't stand up and do anything. They didn't even object to it. They actually went along with it. So we're allowed to take a bigger bite of them over here. I don't know any more than that. I don't know exactly how this works. But there are very few of us on this planet. Oh boy, did I say planet? Obviously not the purpose of this chapter. Um, very few of us can see that. So just to be able to, to see that and notice uh, how the nature of the trick itself is, is, is laid out in such a way so they can amass the most power for themselves without breaking some weird laws. Okay, that's all we know for right now. We will explore that going forward. I just re-listened to that, and that makes perfect sense to the old guard, but it doesn't, it won't to anybody new. Look, let me just break it down for one minute in second grade fashion. You would think if a certain group wanted to get away with certain things that they would lie and then, of course, cover up all the lies, not reveal anything, try to keep everything as secret as possible. But that's not the way this seems to work. We, we know now that's just not the way this works. It's if they want to get away with certain things, then they have to show us certain things. It's the way this, this cosmic law seems to work. So it is very hard to wrap your head about that if that's new to you. But um, you, you can sneak around over here, but you got to show a few people what you're doing. A few people that may be able to perceive it. And then if they do see it, and they do nothing or can't convince their fellow individuals to uh, to change it or to stand up against it, then per this cosmic law they could say, well we showed and some of them noticed, 
And of course, as usual, they didn't do anything about it. So we're going to continue to screw them. It's all the best I can explain it now, but we know that that exists. But there is one more element of that that's worth considering. Absolutely not appropriate for this chapter, but this is too important not to explore it here. Um, and this isn't even in the book. But if they want or need a certain group to notice, the other uh, possibility, no matter how related or not, is the, they need the group that notices to actually manifest it or to move it forward for them in some way. The way I've always uh, talked about, uh, we truthers have been played and tricked potentially more than any other group. So, you know, the, the old answer was, well, they have to show us. That's that law they can't break. But in showing us, potentially, uh, we are manifesting certain things. Uh, we are a, like a strong man that can lift the boulder. Uh, they, in this example, can't lift the boulder on their own. So we're shown certain things, tricked. We lift the boulder up thinking that's so right, righteous and just, to, and just to lift the boulder. But all along, they needed the boulder lifted up and put back up on top of the wall. They can't do it themselves. They show us certain things. We step in, lift the boulder up, and then we think we're accomplishing something, but it's exactly what they wanted us to accomplish. All of this w w needs to be left on the table as we move forward. We will continue to explore these topics. Switching gears, let's talk about one of my favorite principles, the principle of what's your threshold. When reality is stranger than fiction, then reality is fiction. If reality is fiction, then it's likely a crafted or hijacked illusion of some kind. Smart people have talked about a reality overlay of some kind, and I keep that on the table. How much here is left over from what's real versus how much has been warped and manipulated over how long of a time? Well, that's open for debate, but there seems to be no doubt at this point the parasites have needed us to shape a reality the way they want it shaped in a sick fashion. And it's like, you know, if reality is a nice soup or what once was a nice soup, they keep wanting to add the ingredient of bat's heads. Every decade that goes by, life out our window grows more and more unnatural for humans. This is just not open for debate anymore. We again can use the Matrix Trilogy as a tool in trying to potentially see how much of this world is still the original and how much is an unnatural illusion, for lack of better words. No doubt reality is being warped into a certain mold by them. We see that knows what their sick end goals are. We'll try to figure that out. Remember in the third Matrix movie called Revolutions, Neo was destroying sentinels from the quote real world outside the Matrix and with his eyes burnt out to boot. He was destroying sentinels with his mind and he wasn't in the Matrix. Now there are only two possible interpretations of Neo's impossible feat. First, that Neo was actually still inside the matrix, meaning the illusory world could be multiple layers stacked on top of each other. The day you step out, consider you could still be inside, if you see what I mean. The cold world of fraying sweaters aboard the Nebuchadnezzar ship may still be inside the matrix. Second possibility, humans have incredible creative powers over reality itself that have long been forgotten or stolen from us. So, per what happened in the movie, some say that Neo represents all that humans are potentially capable of in or outside the Matrix. Even blind, he could still see, if you see what I mean. Now, it might not be uh, we have the power to just blow things up in this world, but it might be a metaphor for uh, powers long gone, long erased, and long stolen from humanity. And there's almost no doubt. Uh, they've stolen everything from us over a long period of time and uh, you know they are trying in my opinion to whittle us down to a golem or Schmeagol type creature from Lord of the Rings when once we had a whole variety of powers, assets, skills, uh, psychic abilities, I mean other, other things existed for human beings that I'm pretty confident they've taken away from us at this point. 
So in moving forward and analyzing the world to determine what is real, I ask that you establish a coincidence threshold. What's your threshold? And if the chances of something occurring are more remote than the standard you have set for yourself, then commit to questioning what you're being told, no matter what authority is giving you their polished presentation. I would put forth that any coincidence that surpasses your threshold is likely not what it seems or potentially is just an outright lie that the system is presenting to us. You can create any standard you want. If something violates your coincidence threshold, then what is really going on is not what authority is telling you is happening. If an event presented by the news violates your coincidence threshold, assume the news is wrong or they're lying. There will be time to prove it out or disprove it later. Most people blindly just accept all that Anderson Cooper says, when a lot of it would violate their coincidence threshold by a factor of 10 if they ever had established a coincidence threshold. They have none. So when Anderson Cooper presents a series of one in a million coincidences and things that don't line up, no one questions it. For example, somebody may say, well, if something happens and I think there's only a one in a million chance or worse of it happening, then I will at least uh, question what I'm being told, no matter what authority it came from. No. One in a million, it's not reasonable setting your coincidence standard at one in a million because that's not the standard that you would practically apply in everyday life. Remember, the chances of flipping just seven heads in a row on a coin is less than 1%. Everybody knows that or they sense that. Therefore, if you saw a street hustler flip 10 heads in a row, you'd start to question what you were witnessing. You would soon consider the coin must be rigged. If you examined the coin and found it to be normal, you would think that he's some sort of a magician and you just don't know how he's doing the trick. You'd still know deep down it wasn't a legitimate flip with 50-50 odds. It's just 10 in a row. When he asks you to bet some money you can do it again, you'd never take the bet. Why? Because in their normal lives, people carry a degree of healthy skepticism. While watching Anderson Cooper, that monster, watch him every night on uh, 360 on CNN, <laughs> our most basic elements of sanity are abandoned when watching that fraud. It's been bred into us that authority is always to be trusted, no matter how absurd their contentions. Oh, and you watch the news today? Oh, they're absurd. The point is, at just 10 heads in a row, you would not think that the man flipping the coin on the street is in any way trustworthy. You would know the chances are too low, and you'd begin to look for other answers to explain the reality you were witnessing. However, when the news anchor, another form of hustler, shows you a 1 in 500 billion coincidence called the solar eclipse, you blindly accept his explanation because it's backed up by Stephen Hawking. Not only that, you've been taught to mock anybody who would question it. It's not just common sense that breaks down in people when the information on the news comes from a known authority like CNN. Morality is quickly abandoned as well if it's a directive that comes from an accepted authority. There are a few million atrocities of war that have been rationalized away over the centuries as uh, it was just following orders. Don't dismiss all of this as trivial. This is a fascinating study of human nature. Decades ago, there was a famous episode in an old TV show called Candid Camera. I mean, for anybody under age 40, they have no idea probably what that is, but it was the original, you know, they set up a mock scene in the camera, uh, the hidden camera follows uh, the person around, and then they're, it's like punked, you know, I guess that's the best way to describe it, but here's what happened in this particular episode. A man stood out on a road which ran across the Arkansas and Texas border. The man wore an official looking state trooper-like hat, but it didn't say state trooper, he wore leather boots and he had sunglasses and he carried a clipboard. It all looked very official. Of course, it would be illegal to present himself as any authority when he was not. As people drove up, he stopped the cars and he told the drivers that oh, the state of Texas is closed today and please come back tomorrow. He wore no badges or police patches. A decent percentage of people, I forget what it was, but a, a decent amount of people, actually turned their car around 
upset they could not enter Texas. I guess they didn't show the people who actually lived in Texas, but the people that didn't live in Texas, oh, we, we can't get to Walmart today, and they turned the car around, if Walmart even existed then, but you know what I'm saying. Very few people were big enough to look this authority figure in the eye and ask, who are you? What authority do you have, asshole? This is exactly the reason the Germans in World War II, the Germans, had perfectly designed and perfectly immaculately tailored uniforms. Every detail was carefully planned right down to the skull pins worn by the SS and everything was beautifully polished. Fashion sense was not their driver. It's subliminal intimidation. From a psychological perspective, the Germans knew it's way easier to get people to do horrible things if your officers look and act the part. However, the power to get people to cut off their own ear doesn't come from high leather boots and a pretty uniform. Something that, you know, traumatic or, or to get somebody to, 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 to do the ultimate, it must, that power must stem from somewhere else, flowing through the well-dressed officers that wield a bit of the source of the power. For that, you cook up a larger-than-life, said to be insane, but also, of course, genius, Harfuhrer. The source of all power and atrocity must be made to be all-powerful, or the whole thing breaks down. So, again, these figures like Adolf Hitler, um, it's a created image uh, they would they would really want no one to know at that time at least no one to know anything about the man himself. I mean, you would create a larger in life figure, and that larger in life figure would create an aura that would flow down through his minions. So a sock puppet like Obama, I mean, some something like that couldn't inspire a Boy Scout troop uh, to get out of bed in the morning, <laughs> let alone to get real troops to charge across uh, a field from their trench. The sock puppet Obama uh, was, was not very inspirational in that regard, but society has, I want to say evolved, but degraded to the point where that, that characteristic of, of a leader is no longer necessary. Uh, if they want to fight wars, they'll cook up other reasons. They don't need some leader to give some charismatic speech. Thus you have Obama pedaling around town in his Pee Wee Herman bike with his little horn and I guess the it may have had training wheels. We've all seen the picture. You don't need a leader anymore to play that role. You, Adolf Hitler played that role. Looking at the example where the guy was saying Texas was closed, you know, basic pushing back is simply what conspiracy theorists do and what the masses don't do. None of our people would have turned their car around because Texas was closed. We question anything that falls outside of our probability threshold, but we do it with things far more bizarre and remote than the flip of ten heads in a row. Again, please remember how probabilities work and how quickly the, the math can add up to huge, huge, huge numbers. For three events, it's the chance of the first event, the chance of the second event, times the third event. 1 times 2 times 3. And it gets to a big number real quick. If the chances of the first event is 1 in a million, and the chance of the second event is 1 in a million, just from these two, the overall chance both can happen back to back is 0. 0.000001 times 0. 0.00001 equals 1e-12. Now, I don't even know what that even means. 1e-12. That's what came up. But I can assure you, it's so remote, the possibility is so astronomically small, it could not possibly be natural if one were to relate it to a what are the chances of something happening threshold. As we like to say in the conspiracy world, when these impossible coincidences happen, something else is going on, no matter what that something else is. But the script of society doesn't allow someone to say something else is going on before you know what that something else is. That type of speculation is not allowed. So we, we're expected to have all the answers before we speak up. We're not allowed to speculate on such topics. But of course, it's just fine when scientists postulate uh, real big topics and they just consider that the outer lining of a black hole can project a simulated data field. 
that type of it's academic thinking. They're allowed to do that. We're not allowed to do what we do. If Neil deGrasse Tyson does that type of thinking between donut bites, well, that's just fine. He's uh, bowed down to in the society. Regarding these kinds of sensitive subjects that we talk about, people demand to see the last page of the book after reading the first page, or even after just reading the title. They need to know the final page why after just hearing the title. That's what we're presented with all day long as conspiracy theorists. We shouldn't need to find the answer first or find the culprit first. What we reality junkies do is simply call out the bullshit served up by the faux authority like the news, the government, science, academia, and big religion. We call bullshit. That's what we do. It's pretty simple, yet we're mocked for it. If you find poop in the woods, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to confidently proclaim it to be a turd. Must you know the beast that lay down the pile before you yell shit? So I would like to ask the world, I know there's a small subset listening, I'd like to ask the world to establish your coincidence threshold. Right now, establish your coincidence threshold. Is it 1 in 500? Is it 1 in 1,000? Is it something else? Remember, everyone would be skeptical if some street hustler flipped just 10 heads in a row. You'd even be skeptical if your grandmother flipped 15 in a row. So setting your threshold at something like one in a million when watching the news is not being honest and consistent with people's actions. Why do we have two different coincidence thresholds applied to this reality? We have one for a man in Brooklyn playing three-card Monty. We have another for the words that come off the cold lips of a news anchor. Why? How many people realize the news anchor is far shadier than the three-card Monty player? He's the highest evolution of a hustler. Why do you assume the plastic man on the ABC News cares about you one bit more than he cares about getting his drug fix or cares about the gimp that he has chained up at home in the closet? Simply commit to questioning with scrutiny anything that surpasses your established coincidence threshold. Set the bar. Set it right now. The solar eclipse surpasses everyone's mark no matter how ridiculously high they set it. The chances of one celestial body fitting exactly on top of the other from the perspective of those on a third variable flying through space at thousands of miles an hour while spinning around a thousand miles an hour, at best, is one in tens of billions, at best. It's likely closer to one in a trillion. And it's impossible if things are real. Remember the slogan, it can successfully uncover a lot of bullcrap in this life over the years. What's your threshold?